holding a gun. His hand was shaking. Bang. About to put on one of the biggest fights of your entire promotion career when Fury takes on you sick. The only time I talk about it is moments like this. The knockout punch in boxing is the best timed punch. Coming up, you're seeing if the other one's just slipping a bit. Is he ready to be taken? When the going does get tough, I feel like I come alive and you've got to show the high performance and show that you know what you're doing. It ruins so many careers. A couple of millions gone missing. So many kids get ruined. Cause is always money. You didn't see the punch coming? Well, I didn't expect it at all. He's Mike Tyson. We had a little bit of a fracas. Oh, he's yeah. a handful, to say the least. Deal with the cartels so that you can actually promote fights. You've built and lost the London Arena. You've been shot in the process. What the f*** are you doing? Blood everywhere. It's 50-50 whether I would get through the night. Did you never just think of throwing the towel in yourself? I've had a lot of setbacks in my life, but they're not setbacks. They're just tests. Frank, welcome to the show. Thank you. It's a pleasure being here, Jake. What is high performance to you? High performance is doing your best at all times, rising to the occasion, um, ensuring that you're, you're delivering in the particular field that you're working in. When the going does get tough, you know, when there's a bit of a, you know, in our business, maybe a mini crisis or something's going wrong, I, I really do then get into it even more and I sort of feel, feel like I come alive and, and and I enjoy that. In boxing, obviously, which is the sport I'm involved with now, um, I'm very good, I think, at, at guiding guys' careers, picking the right moments. The knockout punch in boxing is the best timed punch and the best matches are the best timed matches. You know, if a guy's coming up, you're seeing if the other one's just slipping a bit, is he ready to be taken? And it's, it's finding those moments in time and... Uh, and that that is when you that is when you got to be at your highest, and you got to show the high performance and show that you know what you're doing from. If you do not listen in boxing, you're going nowhere. And that was the same for me, by the way, when I started out. Now you got to listen, you got to watch. You don't know it all. Everybody thinks they know it all like this, and it's not. It's a. I mean, look at your dad. How long did he spend training fighters? How many years? Fifty years. Yeah. Yeah, and it's a, and it's it's the knowledge that you pick up. And that is that. That's and, and smart people pick it up, that knowledge, and pass it on. Um, and the, in this business, I mean, box boxing is like a magnet for idiots. Sometimes you get people who can get. I mean, you couldn't go and manage a football club. You couldn't go and you know run a cricket team or you know various or a Formula One team without any. Any, without any experience in boxing, they suddenly got a manager on the on the scene who knows nothing about boxing, but he's all he's telling them is you should be getting this amount of money, but knows nothing about boxing, and it ruins so many careers. So many kids get ruined, and it's always the, the cause is always money, it's always money. So how do you deal with that when you see that someone has toxic people around them that are no good? I find it difficult with families. Not all families are, you know, are like it. In some, some families and their their sons that they and their daughters nowadays, but their sons are, you know, they have great relationship. There are others where they it's well publicised fallouts over money, where money's gone missing or something's gone wrong, and that's the hardest thing because they've been, you know, for some fighters when that's happened, they it, there's been a a, a, a rift cause. By, by somebody in the family against the team that's been working with them. They then step in and take over as being the manager when they've got no experience of being manager. They then do, you know, tell them all whatever. Then you hear down the road, oh, well, you know, a couple of millions gone missing or three millions gone missing. Four, and it's happens on time and time again. And then the, then the whole family gets ruined because of this money, because somebody stole their money off of their brother or their son. And that's a dreadful position. It's a, it's a real do that to, to, to your own family. It, it, I don't think there's anything worse than that. So what advice would you give to a young fighter that comes to you about spotting who, who they let into that inner circle and who they need to maybe keep outside of it? I think it's very difficult to, to you know, I always just say to them, look, if you're with us, this is how it is. This is how we're going to do it. You're going to get X amount of fights for the first year. We'll sit down the second year. We'll work out what the money's going to be for the second year and how many fights. And that go. And, and obviously, at the start of each year, that'll happen until they get into the big time. Then it's a fight by fight situation. It's, it is difficult because they just pick up friends on the way. 
They pick up people on the way. It happens in football. If you think about Anelka, when he was at Arsenal and his brother and all the nonsense that went down, it just happens. And people put their trust and it's and it, and it, all, it will continue to happen. You can only try and explain it away. But I think now, nowadays, I sort of nap it from the beginning. I, I, you know, when you sit down with them, you walk away, you get up and you say, this is going to be hard work at the end. You can see it. Do you then walk away if it's going to be it, I have walked away, yeah. I have. I have walked away from it and because life's too short. I've got, you know, I'm not sure I'll be working with somebody who wants to work with me rather than wants to think they're going to use me a bit and to, you know, to f- do whatever they feel they're going to do because I know it won't work out for them. So what are the red flags then that you spot? Because, you know, for everyone, life's a negotiation. They come from the right? background, want to push themselves up front straight away. They want to get in the limelight and all that. And it's not about them. It's about the fighter. Is about the boxer. So how do you avoid not being cynical then? Because you've got to see the next young talent that comes to you, but you've been burned, you've seen these kind of dysfunctional behaviours. How do you avoid cynicism? I think what you've got to look at, you look at odds. You know, how many good... Look, life every, every day is not going to be a great day, is it? If it was, then you wouldn't know what a great day is because that would be the norm. You have your ups and downs. And so I look at it and think to myself, the percentages are you're going to get a couple of wrong ones in there. And that's how it is. And it might be also a situation where it don't work with them for me, that work with me for them. Like that, it doesn't gel for them. And I get that. And that's happened as well in the past. But, you know, invariably, I think, I think the reputation I've built and, you know, and, our business is built over the years with fighters that we is that we do deliver and that we do look after guys coming through and building. We're very good at that. Can we touch on that then about, you know, fighters coming to you and saying, I'm going somewhere else. I remember Gordon Ramsay on this podcast, we spoke about his golden rule for life. He said, take it professionally, not personally. How do you not take it personally when a fighter comes to you and says, I'm off? Frank. In the early days, I used to take it very personally because you put your heart and soul into it and you work hard. It's not just that. I mean, how many how many fighters stay with the same trainer? They don't. Very few of them stay with the same trainer in their whole career. So it is what it is. Now, how do I take it now? That's it. You know, on on to my next job. I'm, you know, I'm I'm not going to get bogged down with that. That's yesterday. I don't dwell in the past. I don't live in the past. I live for today, and that's all I care about. What I'm doing today, because if I'm doing good today, hopefully tomorrow will be. Even better. How do you do that though? Because I've got good, good um, mindset. That's my mindset. It always has been. I mean, I'm. I, I don't. I've had a lot of setbacks in my life, but they're not setbacks. They're just tests. And get over them and get on with it and do it. We'll talk about some of them. When you say I've had a lot of setbacks in my life, where does your brain take you to? Various things. I mean, biz, from business business perspective. I mean, I built London Arena. In Docklands, that was a in those days was the biggest indoor arena in London. I mean, it's twelve and a half thousand seat venue, multi multi purpose venue. The WWE wrestling tournament there. I had Sinatra there. I had Pavarotti there. I had you know all the bands at the time. Everybody played there. Can I just ask you then before we go on to what happened next? What does it feel like when a lad from an estate in Islington? has built an arena in East London and he's hanging out with Frank Sinatra to open this thing. I mean, surely that is a moment where... It's surreal. Thinking, What's it's, a, it's surreal. It is. It's very, it is a surreal situation. I was promoting him and uh, and we was going for, you know, going out to dinner and so forth with him. Did and you hang out with him? Fun. Yeah, yeah, it was good fun. And I was only a kid. Well, I was a kid compared with him. But he was, he was, he was, probably one of the most interesting people I've ever met. We went to this restaurant called um, Mimo's. It was in Victoria, a really good Italian restaurant. We went there after the show. He still had his tux on. He's got sat down in a hot towel. And we went in there. Obviously, it was late because after it was after he'd finished his uh, finished one of his shows at the arena. We're all eating, you know, sitting down eating, and uh, no one else is in the restaurant. It more or less closed by then. And... Um, Tuck's bottle of Jack Daniels 
and he drank the bottle. He'd done the bottle of Jack Daniels. And I remember sitting there, his manager was Elliot Weissman. He was sitting there and he kept going, no more drink, no more. He, he, got to do, he won't be able to do tomorrow. But he was just, he was just brilliant. And the stories were just fabulous. Did you learn lots from him? Yeah, I did see the, a little bit of the other side of him. He got a little bit temperamental. Um, not with me, with, with the thing, with anything, but he was great. And he loved the boxing as well, didn't he? He it's loved it. He, fit, he, he actually was the photographer at ringside at Madison Square Gardens for Ali and Frazier. And Frazier. Yeah. He, he, for Time Magazine, I think he did it for Time Yeah, yeah. Amazing. So coming back to the London Arena, again, before we talk about what happened there, I'm so interested in how a guy in his early 30s, A, has the idea of building an arena in East London. B, makes it happen. And C, manages to deal with the the kind of natural fear that you'd have when you're doing something that big, that brave. The fights that went on Wembley were, were put on by what we called the cartel. Mickey which Duff. Was Mickey Duff, Jarvis Astaire. Jarvis Astaire actually was the chairman of Wembley. Um, Royal Albert Hall was Mike Barrett, was also part of the cartel. He had the exclusives there. So you, could, you couldn't book these places. You couldn't even book York Hall when I first started out in boxing. You're a boxing promoter, unable to get your fighters to the best venues because it's sewn up. Correct. It took me ages to get it, but I got there at the end. So what? I, so at the end, what, what we did was, or what I did was to, you know, this venue came about and uh, and I got involved in building it. And we're building it in Docklands and the, and the, the absolute, the, the press was dire who's going to go there it's you know it's over in in the docks it's dead down there it's you know it's a bad part of london and there was the infrastructure was we was knackered right. with that i mean absolutely knackered and you that. put your own money into this have you yeah yeah uh, and guaranteed money put a lot of money what's, what's and i bought numbers? harvey and i bought i'm up only in 70 percent of it i bought harvey out of it as well what's, so what kind of numbers are we i know it's a long time ago now what sort of numbers i are was we uh when it went when it went uh oh, so I, 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 I think i was in for about 16, 17 mil, which was a lot of money back in late And you 80s. lost that? Yeah, I paid, paid it back and that was it and got on with it and that was it. So why did it go? Terrible rise in the interest rate. The interest rate went to 16% and we were paying like 3 4% over. So you're paying a lot of money over. We had a group of banks that were backing it, a syndicate of banks. I'd done a deal to sell 49% of the, um, the venue to the banks and 10 days before the completion date I got shot so the banks all studied off and you can understand that and it all just fell apart and then from there on I was just hanging on and hanging on trying to you know get it back on track again now you're the first of our guests that have ever told us about being shot but you've also just described it in an incredibly sanguine way would you tell us more about that it was November 89 and uh, I was in the arena I, my offices were in the arena and we were, and I had a show on a small show at Barkingside and Colin McMillan was fighting on there yeah. sweet pea we had a bad little fight Colin I wasn't going now then we finished early I said come on let's go, and go to the fights so we got in the car went to the fights as, as we pulled up I got out of the car and I heard a bang and I looked round I thought what's that I thought it was a car backfiring and I looked and then there was a bloke who was like probably about distance the old engineer is over there what are you about 15 20 foot away whether it is that distance and he's holds holding a gun and shaking his hand i remember his hand was shaking like this and then it clicked and i thought it was a joke to start with then i heard a bang and i knew then it was it was real i remember all this thing plain as any i remember as he grabbed him he went what the fuck are you doing and grabbed him and then he's, he's got him on the floor I've suddenly got, I've got this pain here and I'm holding him aside and all the blood's coming out and I could, then I could feel my lungs starting to, I, I was like gurgling and obviously it's where the blood had gone through my lungs or my lung and it was bubbling up. So, um, you know, I was, felt myself getting, you know, I went down on one knee, take a count of 10, I went down on one knee and uh, then my dad my uncle and my brother were in that they came running out of the, the venue and they said let's get the dots because at, at the show the boxing board can try a couple of dots there so the dots have come out and he said to me he said uh 
have you got a handkerchief? And I'm like, oh, I've got all this blood everywhere. He said, have you got a handkerchief? I went, yeah. He went, hold it on, on the thing. So, so I'm holding this thing on there. And the ambulances were on strike at this particular time. So they bundled me into the back of this old police van, old paddy wagon. So next minute, that's doing a three-point turn. It's banging up the curb, and I'm like, oh, every I could feel every bump. And then off we went, and they took me to the appropriately named uh, Shooters Hill Hospital, and that's where I wound up. Police went to my house, told my wife, they said they've that, it's 50 50 whether I would get through the night. So obviously, you can imagine the concern for her. She was pregnant at the time with our youngest, Henry. And uh, anyway, I woke up, I don't know if it was the you know, day or day, a couple of days later. And I'm on in, on the sort of thing with all the all the bits and pieces in me, tubes in me, and my lungs, and there any drains, and uh, that was it. And then I, then they kept the newspapers away. Then I see the newspapers, and the newspapers were talking about gangland killings and all the shootings, which was all bullshit. I sued all, the, all of them, by the way. And, but you don't get the apology. What, they were trying on. to make out that you were involved. No, they said the gun was in a, used in a gangland. Right. killing a, so a police source said which it, all, it was just rubbish right. it was just all this nonsense going on in some of the newspapers and I sued a few of the newspapers for what? for libel because it was untrue and what the but the ba banks who I'm working with all this stuff's going on you can imagine it just and it just killed the deal and I knew that that was dead and it was getting and they were trying to, you know, my family's trying to stop me hearing what's going on outside. But I was, you know, I've got the nurse, a couple of nurses all the, in there getting me the papers and everything. <laughs> and um, I had discharged myself. I had to discharge myself. So I come out of the hospital. I'd done about four stone in weight in a very short space of time. And I was out, I think I was about nine, ten days in hospital, came out. And, and then I went back to work the following week because it was all... You know, I had to show that, you know, that there was the ship, the ship wasn't sinking. But take us into that hospital ward though, Frank, because was there not a moment where the picking the bullet out of you, you reflecting on what by any stretch is a horrible and traumatic event. Did you never just think of throwing the towel in yourself then? No, my big concern was, my, my main concern was my family, obviously. And everything was... You know, I knew the repercussions of everything I did was tied up into this business. And it wasn't just about the arena. But then, after the shooting, getting out there, everything was survival mode. And then trying to get the confidence of the banks back. And it was tough. And I, was, I wasn't I was strong. Didn't feel strong. But I had to do it. I should have bitten, literally bitten the bullet then and sort of looked at where we were with it and said, right, let's stop this now but i didn't i kept fighting and fighting all the way through and it was just it, ju it was just tough and in the end we just uh we just had to say right that's enough's enough and uh knocked it on the head so when you say you weren't strong you weren't strong physically or mentally at that physically point. what about mentally i didn't have time to think about that i like because i was all i was concerned with was making sure the kids were all right because the kids i had kids at school i made sure my wife's okay making sure that you know everybody's okay and then i had a bit of a thing with my my uncle my late uncle and my dad and that you know especially my uncle came from a was a Brit, from a pretty tough background and he wanted some wretched was he wanted to go and sort it out and i stopped that from happening so did you know who'd done this no i didn't i didn't know i didn't know at the time but i did get to know and i stopped all that from happening and why did they do it a complete lunatic i mean why would anybody do that i mean you know so it wasn't a business thing it wasn't a personal uh, thing really it was well, just it was personal obviously but i mean you know but you say it's a bit <laughs> what what business things you do that you go and shoot somebody i mean yeah. this is not we're not it's not we're not in a drug dealing business or gangster business nothing like that at all it's just an idiot a complete did he, did he get idiot. arrested and there was a trial for it and that was it and i couldn't say who it was because he had a mask on but i'm interested in in you taking the higher ground because growing up on the estate in Islington, yeah, that's not like you don't turn the other cheek. So what is it you've learned in the period of your life up until this moment to decide to do that? I think what my, what the thing for me was at the time was I knew it'd be the ruination for me. It's easy to do that. That'd been easy for, to, for you know, I could have, yeah, you know what, or paints, but I, I didn't want it. 
and uh, it was like playing into what everybody sort of would have thought was going to happen. And I didn't want that. Mm. I didn't want that. I wanted my kids to have a better life. I wanted to, to at that time, I believed that we could still, you know, turn this business, you know, I mean, I didn't know the banks were immediately out out of yeah, yeah. out of it. Then I, I believed that we could, you know, that we could move forward, and that and that for me is all for me was is more important. I'm here. I'm doing it. No one's, no one's, you know, you haven't got the better of me in this. You know, I'm still doing what I'm doing. You know, some idiot tried to do this. All you are is what you are. Is an idiot. What have you gained from it? Nothing. What, who are you? Nothing. What are you known for? Maybe that's it. Rather than being known for something that you you, you may have been proud of what you've done in your life. That's it. So, it did, but it, honestly, it's, it's it wasn't even worth it. I mean, I, I wouldn't advocate advocate my kids do that. What I did, but that's how I was brought up. That's the background I come yeah, from. Yeah. You know, so I didn't. I can't say I don't know any different because I'm intelligent enough to know different. But that wasn't in me to do something like say. I mean, and I couldn't have to be quite hand on my heart. I could not have said it was him. I know who it was. Yeah. I know by the mannerisms and whatever. I never see the face. I never lied in court. Told the truth, despite the facts in court. Well, the stuff they were throwing at me. You thought I was the one who shot someone. It is what it is. And I and and I've got to tell you, the only time I talk about it is, is like moments like this and never it's never discussed i have it, it does it, it doesn't even it's not even in my mind it's not something i even sit there and think if i really did sit and think about it, i probably would go and do something about it but, but i don't and it's not worth it because it's shit, pure negativity what good is going to come out of it any of, of thinking about that nothing i think about the good things i think about i've got to see my son who my wife was carrying, I got to see him born. And that, for me, is all I needed to want. So let's talk about what keeps you going then, because you're suddenly at this point where you've had to fight to get involved in the boxing game. You've then had to deal with the cartels so that you can actually promote fights. You've built and lost the London arena. You've been shot in the process. I mean, this would be enough for most people, yet you're sitting in front of us today in your 70s, arguably about to put on one of the biggest fights of your entire promotion career when Fury takes on you sick. We've then got another huge fight happening in Saudi just a few weeks after that. It certainly doesn't feel like you've slowed down. So what's this all about? Why do you keep going? Because I enjoy it. I enjoy it. I'm, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm 70, 71 years young. That's how I am. I don't want to be putting my feet up. There's times sometimes when you think, oh, sod this and whatever, but... If I do that, I, I would I would absolutely go downhill fast. I wonder whether um, having rivals also keeps your energy up. You know, like Matchroom, who've been around a long time now, created a great business, done some brilliant work over the years, and you would you know how hard it is, so you know how well they've done. I wonder whether actually, as much as there's a rivalry, both you and the Hearns would sit there and go, yeah, we were inspired by them to, to push on and be better and... You redrove each other for I, I know it sounds yeah, I don't even think about it. Do it's, it's, it, that doesn't, and I can understand why you'd say yeah. that. You know, it's a bit like Rangers Celtic or Arsenal. Tottenham. I would look at a big rival of mine in the podcast world or the TV yeah. TV world and be like, I'm inspired by them. That's the level, yeah. that's the standard. I'm going to be no, even I better. Get, I, you don't, I, I, I'll get that. Ali Frazier. Ali, Ali and Frazier. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So you don't have that? No, I don't. Because I, I, I only focus on what we're doing. It doesn't matter what they're doing because it's not. I, I've got no control over what they're doing. I can only control what I'm doing. I can only make happen what I'm involved with. And if I'm successful, and my, you know, my sons at Queensbury are successful in what we're doing, then we're we're, we're doing well, and we are it. We are yeah. at this moment, and everything's everything goes in cycles. You know, you have your ups and downs, and at the moment, we're flying. You know, we're we're knocking. We're gangbusters. We're doing these big shows. We're the ones. Who are pulling them together? We, I mean, heavyweight division. I think within a very short space of time, from when Tyson came back, but I said that we will wind up with the strongest heavyweight situation and with the best heavyweight, which is Tyson, and bringing all these other guys through. We brought some really good youngsters through. We've got guys in really good positions, and that's what we, you know, where we're at. We've got this young kid Moses Ituama, 
who I'm telling you is going to be, remember that name, Moses Ituama. I'm telling you, you're going to, he's going to be the, he'll be the, the next big thing in the heavyweight division. And, and it's just, it's, it's great. You know, you go into the office, I'll go in my office. There's people have been working with me for, you know, 28, 29 years. Some of them have been there. A lot of young kids there now, a lot of youngsters. And it's, it's fun. I mean, it's really, and, and you know, the, the thing about it, what I'm around most of the time is young people because they're young fighters. They're, you know, invariably most of them are young. And I, and I, and it's, and it's, and it's, you get a buzz out of that. See, but that intrigues me, Frank, because there's a lot of people that get to 71 and almost be fearful of young people with young ideas and fresh, uh, and fresh concepts. How do you stay open to the new ideas of a younger generation? I think at the end, I mean, for me, boxing's about one thing. It's about a good fight. You can dress it all up. All the red, I mean, when I got into bo- involved in boxing, the cartel, as we call them, they, the main event used to, there's be a fanfare. You might get a few soldiers in there with the bugles or the trumpets playing the fanfare, or they might put a scratchy old 78 record on playing a fanfare. Nothing else. They used to glove up in the ring, you remember? Yeah, yeah. Before the fight, they'd be glove up in the ring. There was no live boxing on television. They'd show it the following night on sports night and the highlights would go on grandstand on the Saturday. So that's the environment I got into. I, could, I remember the first show I did, Ray Clark was the, uh, he was the uh, general secretary of the Boxing Board of Control. We're bringing the fighters into music. No one, you know, no one had done that. So all this music going, blaring, and he's sitting there like that and they've all got their hands up, turn this music down and all my, you know, but for then it was quite, Innovative. There was no advertising on the canvas, nothing on the anywhere. We put the we brought the advertising in, ring card girls, all that, just to glitch it up and whatever. But you know, at the end of the day, what mattered was was what happened when that first bell went, because that's what it's all about. So, what do you think then of this new YouTube generation as fighters? Because if it, if you're talking about a show, that's a hell of a show. It's a hell of if a you're show. About the quality of the fighting, you can question no, it's a it. Different so. thing. Look. For me, I started off in unlicensed boxing, as they called it. I I promoted Lenny McLean, who's my second cousin, so I, I promoted him. So what they're doing now is no different than what I did back then. But the guys I was doing it with were, were coming from a fighting background. You know, a YouTuber doing it, and I mean, I'm not being disrespectful. If, they, if they, they've built a business up through being a... Uh, you know, being a YouTuber and they've got hundreds of thousands or millions of followers and two of them think they can go and make some money out fighting each other, providing they're med- it's medically supervised, providing that it's properly refereed and everything's there, good luck to them, God bless them. I have no problem with that. But what I do have a problem is when people talk about it like it is what I would call I suppose legitimate boxing or licensed boxing, because a lot of these guys wouldn't get a license wouldn't last five minutes. Come on, but good, yeah, they get money as I say, as long as they don't get hurt. Um, good luck to them. But you know, we got involved in one. I got Tommy Fury, Tyson's uh, brother, for um, Jake Paul. Jake Paul actually now has a license, and he was licensed when the fight was made. And Tommy, I think that was his eighth or ninth fight. But the level the pair of them are at is down here. You know, they, they win a British title at this stage of the game. Whether they go on to do that, I don't know. Um, but at the time that fight was made, they would struggle. And what would they get for a fight? Eight round money, which is not a lot of money. They went and got millions apiece. So how can you say, don't wow. do it? So what would they normally earn if they were just a couple of regular fighters what, at a low level? A, 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 a eight rounder, you might get lucky to get eight grand, ten grand a fight. And they would have made from this fight four or five million. Millions. Each. So how do you knock that? Mike Tyson. Yeah. I've got to ask you because I remember that you'd arranged for him to come and train at my dad's gym when he first fought Julius Correct. Francis. Yeah. So he came up to Manchester. Yeah. And there was all the hullabaloo around him when he first came in fighting in England. And then he came back the year uh, later on, didn't he, to fight Lou Savarese in Glasgow. Yeah. Your confrontation that most men <laughs> wouldn't survive and I'm interested if you tell us about it it's well documented he went into graft jewelers and spent sort of four or five million on jewelry in there million million and basically thought 
or told them that I was going to settle the bill. You know, why would I do that? <laughs> Number one, and I can imagine the missus. Why would I do that? And he went back, and I, I actually called uh, Jay Larkin, who's at Showtime, Ken Hirschman, who's the lawyer at Showtime. I said, listen, he's spending a fortune. And he went, don't, they said, don't worry. I suppose he told his manager, who, who was um, Shelley Finkel at the time, they said to him, you know, they just have to take it off his purse. But they never put, the bill never got settled. So he was coming back to fight, and that got pushed back a couple of times. And Graf want to get paid, obviously. They're coming on to me. And I just said to him, it will get, you know, I'm, I'm just passing on the information, you know, what they've been telling me. And cut a long story short, he didn't, it didn't get settled. The fight kept getting put, pushed back to the second fight. Then he was coming in. We sold out Scotland. We was doing a show in Scotland, sold it out. And then he pulled out of it. And then about eight days later, they said, he's coming back. We can do it. I said, well, look, people cancelled their tickets, hotels and all this and that. It was, a, it was pretty much of a disaster. So we redid whatever the deal was going to be. He came in. And the first time he came in, he, they wouldn't let him through the airport. They, uh, they, sorry, they wouldn't let, me, wouldn't let us pick him up from the, like, uh, the VIP or whatever area you want to call it. They wanted him to go through the airport. And it was mayhem. I mean, it was unbelievable. The press, people, it was just like, it was great publicity, but it was what it was. Second time, they told him he's got to go out the back back way now. And he was really pissed and he and he wasn't the same person. He was he was taking antidepressants. He was Lof, Lof, Lof or whatever he was on at the time, which, you know, everybody was aware of uh, what he was telling. I'm not telling any secrets out of school. And he, but he was, he was totally different. And, um, he went into this jeweler's shop, went back in there, and uh, th there was a girl working there. They fired her, or she'd left, and he basically had bought all this jewelry because he met her. How it turned out, he met her in the in the hotel. He was staying at the Grosvenor. We set a gym up there, and he met her in there. She worked in there, and he's giving it Jack the Lad, going in there buying all this stuff, give her the commission, and anyway, that that's that that was the basics of it all. And uh, anyway, I got a call. And I went up to see him. And I said, he's, he's pissed about something. I said, well, what, what about? Anyway, so I went up there and uh, he was really pissed off that the, this girl had got fired and or well, she'd left or whatever happened and about this jury and whatever. And I just said to him, you don't, what, what are you telling me for? It's your jury. I don't wear it. It's your stuff. That's it. And they're supposed to deal with it. You, and next minute we... It was all off at all meetings without me knowing about it. It didn't... I mean, he just threw, threw a punch and that was it you didn't see the punch coming well i didn't expect it at all I mean, it's not <laughs> like um you know he's mike tyson he's a professional fighter and he's yeah. a bit of a handful to say the least so that was that we had a little bit of a fracas and then at the end uh the fight went ahead they wanted me to, uh, ken hirschman wanted me to um call the police which i didn't do and that was it and i said he can fight they flew everybody in from the state because he'd have been in trouble this is what's so stupid I done him a favour. I done him a huge favour. He was on parole. If I'd have said something or done something, he would have wound up back in prison, finishing his sentence, mm -hmm. rightly or wrongly. That's what would have happened. And you know, and I didn't do that. I didn't pay him. I told him I'm fining him, so he can fight, and he's not getting paid. That's it. You find him his purse. Yeah, and that's it. Did you tell him that while you were in the room? I told. Uh, no, not not there. I mean, it was right, after yeah. this was after the event, and that was that. And then I hadn't seen him until I was out in Saudi, <laughs> which was about was that about a month ago or so yeah. when we was out there. It's the first time I seen him, and we were sitting in the in a, His Excellency uh, Turkey's house, and he was I'm here and he's right, and then he came over. And that's the first time I sort of really I've seen him, but not. And he came over and he went and he said, Bro, "Brother." And he, getting hold of me and I'm like and then he and he then he started kissing my hand and I thought what the fuck <laughs> it was so you get flashbacks when he was approaching <laughs> <laughs> no that I weren't going to stand for that because I that's what that's what I stood for the first time but it was yeah, look, it is what it is and it's a lot of nonsense at the end of the day it's just garbage well fun right we've reached the point where we do some quick fire questions so the first one is what are your three non-negotiable behaviours oh. for living a high performance life what are your rules? What are the behaviours that you expect? I don't stand for bad, bad manners. Yep. 
I don't stand for bullying and being professional at all time. Very good. What advice would you give a teenage Frank just starting out? A teenage Frank, follow your dream. Keep working hard. The harder you work, the luckier you get. Just work hard, be dedicated. You can't cut corners. You've got to really, really focus on the prize. Biggest strength, greatest weakness. Biggest strength. My biggest strength is probably one-mindedness. And your greatest weakness? One-mindedness. <laughs> if you could it works go both ways. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> if you could go back to one moment of your life, what would it be and why? I think when I I, I look back, I mean, I've had, I've, and I've been blessed. I mean, I've been been to, I mean, I got invited to Nelson Mandela's house after, after um, Nigel Ben got beaten by uh, Sugar Boy Malinga. I thought it was a joke, and they phoned me next minute. I'm next time in his house, sitting with the most impressive person I've ever met in my whole life. Sitting there, this man who's a boxing nut, loved his boxing. A couple of quick boxing specific ones: Fury or Usyk? Fury all day long. Why? Too big, too fast, too strong. Greatest fighter of all time? Greatest fighter I've seen in the flesh would be Sugar Ray Leonard. He's the best I've seen in the flesh. In film, on film, probably Ray Robinson. And who would win in a fight between a prime Tyson Fury and a prime Mike Tyson? That's a tough fight, but he wouldn't have it all his own ways. I mean, I know what his strengths are, Mike Tyson. Mike Tyson would not be able to bully. He, he was a bully. He'd bully guys before the fight. He'd bully them at the weigh-in. And the fights he lost were against guys he couldn't bully, like Evander Holyfield. Couldn't bully him. Evander Holyfield was a warrior. And Tyson, he wouldn't be able to bully. And I'd fancy Tyson to beat him. Tyson Fury to beat Mike Tyson. Yep. Final question. Your one golden rule that you'd like to leave people thinking about for living a high-performance life. If you're going to live a high-performance life, you need high-performance fuel. So don't drink crap wine. Best one yet. Good. Thank you so much, Frank. Really Pleasure. appreciate your time. Very best Thank of you. luck with everything.